God bless you and good morning. Sorry about the delay. A um, couple of delays. I was trying to upload my uh, face or my uh, Facebook Live video to YouTube, and it ended up taking a lot longer than I anticipated. So I didn't have use of my computer while it was being uploaded to YouTube. But that's all done now, and I have you know just. A few things to say and I wanted it to be a little bit different I really couldn't I really didn't think too much of any particular subject uh, that I wanted to talk about so I thought I would just do something a little bit different and I remember somebody said a real long time ago if you can't think of something then just give me your testimony <laughs> and uh, I thought of a lot of testimonies not just of testimonies in my own life, but also testimonies in the life of other people that I have met, and also the testimony testimonies of the life of the prophet. And it all has to do with unconditional love. And so I was talking with uh, Sister Mary, which is John Pastor John Vila's daughter, and we were talking about the unconditional love of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it was very inspiring to me. And I thought, well, Maybe that's what the Lord wants me to talk about. And so that's what we'll we'll talk about. And I just want you to keep in mind that, you know, um, there's, there's no big eyes or little U's. We're not trying to exalt any particular person, but we're just trying to point to the nature and character and unconditional love of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not about any flesh body man. This is all about the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So I do have a few quotes and I do have one or two scriptures that I'd like to share to you, but I didn't have my computer used, so I didn't really collect a whole lot. And I said to myself, well, God's in you. You don't need a computer. And so <laughs> that's the truth, you know, because maybe one of these days, if uh, we may not have uh you know, the things that we're used to having, and we're going to have to fully and completely rely on the Lord Jesus Christ to provide everything we have need of. And just yesterday, I think the Lord kind of showed me that, you know, don't worry, just pray to me and I'll take care of it for you. So if we put him first, you know, the Bible says, he who trusts in him shall not be ashamed. And he can do exceedingly above anything we ask or think. And so when you, the right mental attitude towards any one of God's promises will bring it to pass. Amen. So we're looking forward to hearing from him this morning. So I'd like to say, I didn't, I didn't have time to pull up the scripture, but <clears throat> I know there's a scripture in the Bible that says, no man have greater love than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. And that's basically what I'd like to talk about this morning. Because the Lord Jesus Christ has the attributes of love. He is love and his attributes never die. This is an age of judgment. But God, to the believer, the attributes of love are within the believer. And we've seen that in the life and the testimonies of many people. So let's go ahead and talk about that. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we're so thankful, dear Lord God, that you're here among us. We're so thankful, dear Lord God, that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. We're thankful, dear Lord God, for the testimonies you have given to show yourself the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we pray our main purpose is to edify the body of Christ. And it doesn't have to be a formal preaching service to edify the body of Christ. It can just be a service of speaking from the heart with things that you touch the people to speak, dear Lord God. So, dear Lord God, we're thankful that you're speaking today. <clears throat> we commit our lives and our testimonies unto you for the edification of the body of Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. So, Brother Branham says in this quote, Now, the first thing I want to say is Jesus never lived for himself. His life was spent for others. That's perfectly eternal life. When you say you go to church and you do good things, that's fine. 
But when you live your life to yourself, you have an eternal life. Eternal life is living for others. It proved it when it come in the Lamb of God. He lived and he had eternal life because he did not live for himself. He lived for others. And you receive eternal life by receiving that day. And you don't live for yourself no more. You live for others. And that means a lot to me because I've seen that in action. And Brother Branham says, somebody said, well, how can you stand and let anybody call you such bad names? You don't live for yourself. You live for others that you might redeem that man. You become sons. And the trouble of it is, church, that you have forgot where, that you were sons. You're a son. You're taking Christ's place. You're a son, so you don't live for yourself. You live for others. Now, this brought a thought that um, when people, if you anybody wants to be an effective witness for someone else, that they have to have something different than the rest of the world has. And you can see it all over the news these days of people road rage and violence and anger and suicide and stress and you know and it all stems from sin so sometimes we have to in order to be a witness and a testimony you have to show something different than what the rest of the world has and that's christ in you the hope of glory and sometimes god is going to express himself in judgment to the unbeliever and sometimes he's going to express his grace and mercy as that scripture says uh i will have mercy on who i will have mercy and whom i will hardeneth and so it's up to the lord and that's why we must follow the leading of the holy spirit because the leading of the holy spirit is going to let us know when to express those attributes which one, which one he wants to express at that time Amen. So, well, Brother Branham, I can live for this brother because he sure is a nice man. That's not it. Live for the man who hates you. Live for the person who would kill you if they could. That's what they've done to him. They killed him and he died that he might save them. That's eternal life. When you, when that's in your bosom, you're facing heaven then. Amen. But you sacrifice your own things and give them up like the sheep gives up its wool. You look on towards Calvary. Amen. And as long as you're looking at Calvary, as long as you're looking at that eternal substance, that is what gives you your strength. The Bible says also, when I am weak, I am strong. And there may be times where you're going to be rejected. There may be times where you're going to feel down. There may be times when you try with all your heart to witness somebody and they don't accept it. But if you look towards Calvary and you remember that that's what Christ did, it makes it different. When I am weak, I am strong. It's str and you may be weak in your flesh, but it's strengthening the person that you really are on the inside. That's the most important thing. And that strength is made in perfect weakness. And that perfect weakness sometimes comes with the hard trials of this world that we have to face. And so it's all good. All things work to the good, to them that love God, to those who are called for his purpose, according to his purpose. Amen. We are called according to his purpose. Love is a powerful force. And when love is projected... It comes to the end of its strength. Sovereign grace will take it up from there and project the object that love has asked for. That's the reason we have a Savior tonight is because God so loved the world that he, his love being projected to the world produced a Savior. God wanted to see you well so much. He, his love went out and it produced an atonement for your sickness. 
as for your sins. It was the love of God that constrained him to do it. Amen. And so it also, this statement also reminds me of something else Brother Branham said when he said, there's a message called a deep that calleth to the deep. And when there's a deep in here, or when there's an earnest desire within a person to have more of God or see God, then there's going to be something out there that's going to respond to that, and that is God himself. So if there's any part of God that you are desiring, if there's a desire to be right with God, there's going to be a way to be right with God. He has a provided way. And so if you have a desire to see someone saved, to see someone overcome, then there's a way for that to happen, but they have to accept that way. Amen. So God has provided all things that we have need of to be more, to be like him. Amen. But people have to accept it and go to it and accept his way over their own way. Love is a powerful force. It'll run a woman, a mother right into the flames of fire after, um, if she knows that she's plunging herself to death, there's nothing more stronger than love. Love will make you trust. Did you hear that? Love will make you trust. You might go and know that you belong to the greatest church in all the provinces of Canada. You might know that you're a charter, that you might know that you're a, the charter member of the greatest church in the nation. And then you would do things that you would not do if you belonged to a little mission somewhere in some corner that had the love of God in your heart. Amen. Sometimes love and trust will constrain you to do things that you might not normally do. Love has an expression. Love has no fear. Perfect love casts out fear. There's a Bible scripture that says, he that feareth has not been made perfect in love. So if you know that you can love the Lord with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your might, with all your everything that you are, then you can you can defeat fear and you can trust him. And then you know no matter what happens, it's going to be okay. Amen. One of the great things I find among people is fear. And what makes people fear is lack of confidence. If you lack confidence, it'll make you fear. That's because you're not trusting the Lord enough. But if you love, it casts away fear. And that's the way God wants his church, not so many as char charter members. He doesn't want people who are just going to show up just to show up. But he's going to want people who mean business with the Lord, who really loves the Lord, the people who are loyal to him, the people who believe him, those people who have confidence in him. Amen. And, and they, now this is, um, well, let's just say this. Uh, when Jesus comes to the city, there ought to be the flags out and people on the street talking about him and glorifying him and the sick of and sick and afflicted accepting his healings, blessings and out on the street testifying to everybody. Amen. But we give him the last place. There's an example of not perfect love. When you are giving God the last place, he doesn't like that. He wants the first place. He wants your all in all. He wants a daily sacrifice of your self on the altar. He, he doesn't want a lamb on the altar anymore. He doesn't want a flowers on the altar. He wants you on the altar. He wants you to sacrifice your own ideas and your own ways and your own desires so that he can show and reveal himself to you. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all might come to repentance. Now the day is drawing close at hand. After a while, he has all... Now, I, there, there's not too much of the backstory I put on this, but this is when Brother Branham was talking about the foot wash flunkies, about how you know, they would have these great big parties with this well-educated, dressed man, but then they would have the flunkies, the people who were nothing in the eyes of other people, 
but they were something in the eyes of God. And they had a lot of flunkies, just guys around this place. He puts them all out to do their duties. And the first thing a chariot comes up, and most of the travel in the days of Palestine was by foot. And the only transportation that they had besides the animals, uh, and most of these were beasts and of burdens that packed the burden, but the great chariot rides up, the doctor, reverend, so-and-so, he come out, uh, he come in and he embraced him and he took him to the house and the flunky took the horses around and groomed them and put them into the stable and made everything ready and shined up his chariots while he was at the banquet. Everything just all polished like a modern day blow up today, as we call it, in the name of religion too. And most of the people walked and when they walked along the roads, the animal walked around r along the road also, and they didn't have concrete roads and asphalt like we have today. They got these just dusty paths along up over the hills and down through the desert. And as they went up that way, and the beasts walking along there too, the, the dust taking care of the odor from the animals and the droppings and so forth, and it got into the dust and it smelled awful along the road. And the Palestinians in those days wore a robe and had a underneath garment just come to the knee. And they wore sandals. And as they walked, this robe swept up the dust. And it got for the perspiration on the legs and on the face and the hands. And it caused an awful odor. And the odor from the animals that traveled on the road where the person had come. And when they came to the door, they were in no condition at all to be enter entertained at that time because they smelt from the road. And their face was burning from the hot rays of the Palestinian sun. And what they did when there were a guest coming, they always had a flunky out the door. At the door, the first fellow that you met was a foot wash flunky, and the he had the worse job than all the other flunkies. He he was the the foot washer. Think of it. They had dust and maybe the urine and maybe the dung of animals all over people's feet, and he had to wash it. If that wasn't the lowest form of a a server, a, you know, a foot wash flunky, that's what Jesus became to show his humility. Amen. And to think of it, our blessed Lord Jesus become a foot washer down from the highest place in heaven to take the lowest flunky's job on the earth and to think that we're somebody because we wear good clothes and ride in a nice car, shame on you. It's a pity that we got so far away from God. We're very religious. Oh, yeah. We think we have a lot of knowledge. We think we got a lot of education. But it takes somebody to realize that they're a nobody in order for God to make them a somebody. Amen. So few, I hate to say this, but so few of professed Christians today in our land know so little about God. They know their religions. They know they might know be educated and know a doctrine. But can you humble yourself to the truth? Can you humble yourself enough to take a lower position in knowing that it's God's will for you to be in a lower position to express him? Amen. He humbled himself and that's what makes him so great to me. That's what makes him so real to me is to think that he was willing to come down here and not be some somebody great somebody, take some great name or something like that. He made himself humble and became a servant to all of them. That's my Lord Jesus. That's the one I love. That's the one I want to give my life for, entirely to him and to serve him and to work for him and do everything I can to get the people to look at him. That's what our purpose is, amen? To get not to look, not to get the people to look at ourselves, to get the people to look at him and realize he's real, and that and believe him and love him and he's he's lovely, he's precious. But becoming a foot washer, he took the towel and girded himself, and washed the disciples' feet. Let them, let him that's great among you become the servant of all. That's that's what was his example. But us today, hostile. Yes, sir. I wouldn't stoop to that fellow, though, that old drunk. You know, <clears throat> uh, I wouldn't have nothing to do with him. Oh, I'm Dr. Jones. That's the reason we're not getting anywhere. 
That's the reason our pulpits are weak. That's the reason today we don't have signs and wonders in our churches. That's the reason today we don't have an old-fashioned revival. Because we, we're thinking we're somebody when we're nothing. Amen? The only way that you're somebody is not according to the way other people see you. Or because of your educational status. Or because of your money. The, God recognizes when the real believer, when he's humble enough to really accept the Lord Jesus Christ and everything that he is. The Bible says when a man thinks he's something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. He knows nothing that he ought to know. He ought to know that he's a sinner. Amen. Hallelujah. I know I say some pretty strong things sometimes, and I know I put some quotes on Facebook, which appears to be pretty strong. But it's not because I'm prideful about anything. It's just because... I believe what Brother Branham said is the truth. And I want to express the truth because we don't want people to be deceived by the false. Amen. Sacrifice. So, sometimes we have to sacrifice. Now, these are my own notes here, just to let you know. And this is just to help me to remember some things that I want to talk about. So I hope you'll bear with me for a few minutes. But the things I've learned from people who I've met who really had the Holy Ghost in their life is I've seen them sacrifice their lives without expecting anything in return. I'm going to talk about my pastor a little bit, but that doesn't mean that I'm trying to exalt the man, John Vila. It's just that I'm trying to show examples of the life of Christ I saw in my brother. And I've seen him do these things, and that's why... I was so inspired by that life that I started doing the same. It's because I was inspired and believed that that was the character and the attributes of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've seen him sacrifice his life without expecting anything in return. When he had very little money, he would buy food and make the food and prepare the food. And he had help, and I recognize those people who had help, but he didn't want to... Um, he didn't want to uh he didn't want to have anything in return. He just wanted people to be feel comfortable and people to be fed so that they were satisfied. Because he recognized how Jesus felt bad for the people and he fed the five thousand. So he recognized that. And yesterday when and I'm not trying to brag on myself at all, please don't think that, but yesterday when I I went to go take Liz's trash, you know, that there was no, there was no bad bag in the, in the trash. And, and I didn't want to, I wanted to make sure I got to the dump on time. And I just grabbed the trash bag and I started just grabbing the trash with my hands and throwing it in the bag and just said, oh, I'll just wash my hands. It's no big deal. I don't want nobody to feel bad, but it's just, I believe that God does things for a reason to show us some things. And when I was doing that, I was taking the trash with my hands. It wasn't pretty, <laughs> you know, but I would throw it in there. And I thought to myself when I was doing that, uh, how the Lord showed me that Jesus was a foot wash flunky and he had to do some things which were gross like he did. He washed the disciples feet, even though they might have had dung on them even though it may have had urine from the dust he did it anyways because why he was serving he wanted to serve and he didn't care what it took to serve his brother he didn't care what it took i don't care if i get dirty i don't care if there's look at moses when look this just came to me fresh just now look at moses when miriam who god got angry at because she said something that God didn't like. She got leprosy. And Moses went to Miriam, even though he could have gotten leprosy and died from it. Love constrained him to have grace and mercy towards her. And he went to where she was at. And she was like, I'm unclean. I'm unclean. Don't come close. He said, come here. He didn't have a worry in the world. All he thought was, is love and and love constrained him to live for somebody 
who maybe didn't deserve to be lived for because they angered God. Now I think of the same thing with my brother John, that many times even though his his grandson, even though he didn't seem like he was worthy to receive any blessings at all, my pastor would go out and he would drive in the night when he was tired, when he didn't want to, when he was hungry or when he was sick, and he would go pick him up. Why? Because love constrained him to do it. Because in this life, we have to show some, some, something different than the rest of the world has. That's how much he wanted to be a witness and a testimony. He had the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when I was going away, when I, right after I was taking the trash, um, God showed me that Jesus was a foot washed funky. And I remembered the story that Brother Branham said. And right after that, I also remembered how when me and Brother John were cleaning windows one time, there was a great big rose bush. And he had, John had to get at this window to clean it. And he had to get around this great big rose bush. And he, he was getting poked and he didn't have any sleeves on, you know, like he had a short sleeve shirt. And it was, all these thorns were poking him and it was making him bleed and it, and it hurt. It wasn't easy to do window cleaning sometimes when you had to fight through all these obstacles to serve others so that they could have a clean view out their windows. And when he got done, he said, the Lord showed me that Christ went through something similar, but much, much worse. And he said, I could never outdo my Lord. He said, I could never sacrifice more than my Lord. And he recognized that it made him realize some of the reality of what he went through. And it caused the life of God to become more real in his life. And so it's it's a beautiful thing when, but you know, Brother Branham said, don't just preach me a message, live me a message. And that's what my goal is. I don't want to just preach you a message. I want to live a message. Because that's a greater thing than anything a person can say is when they have the life and the testimony and the nature and the character in their life. Look at what happened when Brother John would preach a message and sometimes many people would come right after and show their colors and immediately defy things he was saying that was from the prophet. And they wouldn't be able to see the revelation and they fought against it. But how did my pastor react. He didn't get all mad. He didn't storm out the door. First, he would try to reason with him. And then when they would want to come and visit him, even though maybe their heart wasn't right, what did he do? He treated them as if nothing ever happened. He treated them with just much love and respect as a person who was just getting to know somebody else, perhaps, or a good friend. And <clears throat> even Jesus never missed an appointment. And even though he was going to be rejected at this party that they were having back in the days, he still went because he was humble enough to want to show the character and nature of Christ to someone else so that they could see that the Lord was real. Amen. So there's a lot of examples of we can get. <clears throat> yep, he still loved people, unconditional love. For if you love those only who love you, what reward will you have? But there was a time where Christ said, my spirit will not always strive with man. Sometimes he takes his messenger away so that we can decide what are we really going to do with the Word of God? What are we going to do with the testimony that we received? We've seen God being real. What are we going to do with it? If you look to the natural, you're never going to see it. But if you look to how it compares with the life of Christ, then maybe you can look beyond the veil 
and see God. Amen. Brother Branham had that message, the worst sinner in Santa Maria. And there was another message when divine love, I can't remember specifically, I'm just paraphrasing, but when divine love is projected, sovereign grace takes place. And in that message, he talks about this bull, this great big bull where I think that bull had killed someone like before, and it was a mean bull. And everybody said, don't you cross that fence line because that bull will kill you. But Brother Branham had to go pray for somebody. So he wasn't going to let anything get in the way of him praying for somebody because he had unconditional love to want to see the person healed. So what did he do? He crossed the fence and he saw that bull and that bull started scraping the ground and it looked very intimidating. But do you think it intimidated Brother Branham? It might have at first, but not when the spirit took over. When the spirit takes over, brothers and sisters, it's something different. You know Christ is there. You know Christ is real. You know Christ can do something beyond all imaginability. And so he will continue to show his forth, but he got to take him at his word. And so he said to himself within himself, Bull, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to disturb your place over here. I didn't mean to make you angry. I just have to go pray for somebody. So, Bull, I'm sorry. I know that you're just trying to protect your property. That's understandable. But if you'll let me go and pray for this person, I'll leave you alone. And sure enough, that bull started running towards him, and I think he just laid right down before he got there. It was a miracle. I believe in those types of things. I believe in those miracles, and it inspires me to know Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so, the same thing with the bees. One time, Brother Branham was, uh, it was really hot out. He, I don't think he had a shirt on. He was mowing and he hit a whole bunch of bees like a hornet's nest. And usually those hornets or those bees would sting them right, sting a person, anybody right away. I've gotten stung by a hornet's nest before too, a bee's nest. And uh, it's happened more than once. And But what happened with Brother Branham? He projected divine love. He projected divine love and he said, Look, bees, I'm sorry. Isn't it amazing? Do you think that, is it crazy for a person to be able to know that they could actually speak to nature, speak to an animal when they don't speak our language? But I believe it. You know why? Because God is the one who created it. And it's God that lives within a person, you know? And so, God has control. And he said, bees, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hit your nest. I'm just trying to mow my lawn. If you'll just forgive me, please just go back and I'll promise I won't do that again. And sure enough, all the bees flew around and they went back to their home and they didn't bother them anymore. That's a miracle. Amen. It's Jesus Christ. It's not the man. It's, it's Jesus Christ in the man that believes that God is more than able to accomplish what we think and feel. Amen? After Jesus was beaten and crucified and he suffered, he had to drag a large cross. Even though they stuck a, a spear in his side, they put a crown of thorns on him. He suffered the worst suffering that anybody could suffer. And what did he do on the cross? He said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Amen? If that doesn't show unconditional love, I don't know what does. I remember Brother John telling me that the times where he would go down to church after a big rain and he would put boards down so people wouldn't walk through the puddles and so people wouldn't get their feet wet. But he got his feet wet so other people wouldn't get their feet wet. Please don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to glorify a man. I'm just trying to say, look, these are the attributes and the character of God. You know, and so we've seen people sacrifice for other people. And it's a beautiful thing to see that happen. One time in the church, I ran every single electrical wire in the whole church, including charging out the, changing out the main panel, 
Many times I had to go up in the attic crawling around with dust, insulation, mouse droppings. I didn't expect to get paid. I just wanted the electrical system to be more safe than organized. Am I bragging on myself? No. I'm just trying to say the right mental attitude will constrain you to do some things for other people that maybe other people wouldn't. Many times Brother John and I would cook the food. They would be buy the food, prepare the food, and feed the people and didn't expect anything return. Just wanted the people to be hungry, or didn't want the people to be hungry. Wanted the, them to go away satisfied. Wanted them to be comfortable. Wanted them to be, you know, to enjoy their time in the Word. Amen? That's unconditional love. Look at Brother Branham. He used to travel miles and miles and miles through several states, being tired, wiping spit on his eyes to try to stay awake, just to pray for one person. That's unconditional love. Amen? So we're happy to see that, and it's still going on today. We still see the evidence of unconditional love. If you can look beyond <clears throat> the natural and try to see the supernatural power of God and try to see that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, just remember everything's for a purpose. So instead of getting mad at someone who's trying to cut you off on the road or whatever. Just remember, God's got a purpose. God might be testing you. It might be a blessing in disguise to show the attributes of the Lord Jesus Christ. What shall you do with this Jesus called Christ? Amen? So I just wanted to share that with you. I hope it was a blessing to you. I hope it was edifying to you. And I'm sure many people have testimonies and maybe sometimes... We can share other people's testimonies because I'd like, I love to hear the, the God working in other people's lives. But also just remember if we can, we might, we might, you know, you might run across people who don't agree. That's okay. We can still love them. Amen. And that's the only way anybody's going to see the true to want to change is for them to have a reason to change. And so, God bless you, brothers and sisters. I hope that was enjoyable to you. And we'll see you again next week for another service. May God continue to bless you. Amen.